Music broadcasting live from the Apocalypse After Party. Coming to you from the cozy confines of the COVID castle. It was a black tie affair and the saints were all there, but now we're back home in our secluded bunker on the west bank of the Halifax River. As always, I'm your pandemic professor, Scotty Vico, Scott Velasco, here to guide you through today's very special business. And today, today we are talking about the history of audio recording. And if you're wondering what chapter in your text or pages uh, this refers to, it doesn't. There isn't a history chapter in your textbook, and that means these videos are going to be your primary source of information when it comes to digesting all of this. And let's get right into it. The first recording in human history was 1857. Now that's amazing to me, and I'll tell you why. That means that for however long we have been humans in our present form, and even before that, as long as our planet has had an atmosphere that allowed air molecules to move, every sound that was made from the beginning of our history on was just lost to the air, gone forever, and then suddenly something changes. Suddenly, there is a leap forward, and between 1857 and the present, that technology races, right? I mean, look at us now. We're recording everything. I'm recording this, and this, whatever it is, is going to be around presumably forever. Not that people are going to watch it forever, but probably long past mankind me, sitting here talking to you, will be locked as a digital file somewhere in a vault under Sweden, most likely, right? Why? It just seems to be the way things work in our present, and that's crazy. But let's talk about where it all began. And it begins, we'll head over to PowerPoint, it begins in 1857 with this handsome young fellow wearing what, what appears to be a lovely plaid cravat, right? Kind of looks like Kind of looks like David Crosby, in a way. And his device is called the phonautograph. And the phonautograph that you see here is kind of a peculiar device. It has, well, it has that, that top sort of cylindrical-looking piece. And below that, you see a couple of discs... And then on the other side of the discs, you see what looks like a can with a hand crank, basically. And that was the phonautograph. Edward Leon Scott's idea was that he wanted to visualize sound. He wanted to see what sound waves looked like. It hadn't even occurred to him that it was possible to play sound back. I mean, no one had ever done it. It didn't seem like a likelihood. He just had this idea for an invention that would allow him to actually see the waveforms. So what he would do was he'd make noise into the top of that, into that big cylinder, and that cylinder would funnel the noise down into the bottom, and in the bottom, it would be pressurized into those discs, and those discs have inside them a membrane, this very light, very thin diaphragm, right? And as the air pressure changes around the diaphragm, the diaphragm wiggles back and forth. And the higher the pitch, the faster the diaphragm wiggles, and the lower the pitch, the slower the diaphragm wiggles, and the louder it is, the bigger, and the, the softer it is, the smaller. And then he's turning this hand crank, and there's a piece of paper wrapped around the can. And so as the diaphragm moves, it's pushing a writing utensil, basically. Imagine like a, a pencil. And that pencil's drawing a squiggly line, and that squiggly line looks like the shape of the sound wave that made the diaphragm move. And Edward Leon Scott is thrilled. His device works. He can see what sound looks like. Now, here's why I think this is amazing. Because from this point on, from Edward Leon Scott, immediately we lose this ability to visualize the sound wave. 
Everything that comes after that has no visual component until 130 some years later when we really got the rise of the personal computer. You know, in the probably early mid 80s, we get the very first sound cards. And then in the mid 90s, we get the first DAWs, right, where we're able to record into the computer. And now you've got it on your phone. I mean, you carry around in your pocket a multi-track studio, and when you make noise, when you record the sound into that device, it's drawing a picture of the wave. Exactly the same representation that we would have seen in Edward Leon Scott's drawings. And that is amazing. In fact, let's head over to, uh, let's head over to Pro Tools for a second. And here in Pro Tools, I've got a window. And in this window, I'm looking at two clips. And once you've done this as much as I have, you start to recognize patterns. I know this is a voice. It happens to be my voice, so I kind of know everything about it. But if I didn't, there are still a few things in here that I can tell. Just looking at the waveform, I can see some of the sounds that I recognize. This first clip has a couple of P's in it. Plosives, we call those. And I know what a plosive looks like. It looks like this at the very beginning of the word. You've got a big, fast attack. We're talking sound envelope here. You can see this is really loud and really short, followed by kind of this gap, and then you get the rest of the syllable. And it looks like we've got another P here. Same thing, big loud plosive, gap, and then the rest of the syllable. And we'll listen to that in just a second, but right now let's go to the next clip, because the next clip is a little different, isn't it? In this clip, We've got these softer sounds that I recognize. Here, and here, and here. These kind of fuzzy waveforms. And I see those fuzzy waveforms, and I can already hear in my mind the letter S, that s sound. We call that sibilance, right? And S, it's not nearly as loud as P. It's a softer sound. And it's not nearly as deep as P. It is a higher frequency sound. So if I zoom way in on just that beginning, what you see is just a bunch of tiny squiggles that are very close together. And that is your sound S. And just for our own curiosity, let's hear what these two clips are. Popcorn. Scissors. No, but that's a lesson for another day. We're talking about the past right now, not the present. So, let's get out of Pro Tools. Come back to me. I think all of that is fascinating. And believe it or not, it, in 2008, it occurred to some some beautiful audio nerd out there, one of these people who just gets into this, that some of those drawings that Edward Leon Scott made in France 150 years ago, some of those pieces of paper still exist in private collections. And they went, you know, if that's an accurate representation of the wave... What if we scanned it, and what if we plotted those same points into a DAW and reconstructed that visual representation, and then what if we hit spacebar and let it play? What would we hear? And they did. They did just that. And let's check it out. Let's go back to PowerPoint, because the next slide in PowerPoint is a recording. It is what happened 
when they plotted Edward Leon Scott's drawing into a computer and hit play. Have a listen. Now, if that's not amazing to you, then friends, I have, I've got nothing for you. Think about that. Every sound that had ever been made for the, what, 4.3 billion years that the Earth has been a planet? Gone. Gone forever. And then in, that was actually 1860. It was the third year of the phonautograph. In 1860, that sound is made with no thought or intention that it could ever be heard again. And in 2008, someone hits play. And through speakers and technology that they could never have even dreamt, the sound comes out, heard again. The very first recording of humanity. And it wasn't that long ago in the grand scheme of things. It wasn't that long ago. I have a living grandfather who certainly in his life knew people who were around at that time. That's amazing. That's amazing to me. And between 1857 with the phone autograph, there's another 20 years before anything happens in audio recording. Oh, but the next thing that happens is kind of a biggie. It's the one you probably remember learning about. In 1877, we get to Thomas Edison and his phonograph. But to learn a little bit more about that, let's head over to Business Casual Me in the News Journal Center. Me? So if Edward Leon Scott's concept was a vibrating membrane connected to a small writing utensil that scratched a groove onto a sheet of paper, Thomas Edison had a completely unique idea. It was a vibrating membrane connected to a little needle that scratched a groove onto a rotating cylinder. You see what Edison did there. Actually, Edison's invention did have one tremendous difference, playback. As soon as Thomas Edison recognized that his device would be capable of pushing air molecules at the same rate as the original wave, thereby recreating a facsimile of the sound that came in, the whole history of audio recording begins. Let's have a look at some of these cylinders. The original cylinder that Edison used on the phonograph was made of foil. Now the trouble with foil is you could only play back a few times before the needle had worn the groove down and you had no recording. You were left with noise. So Edison began the process of trying to improve the medium, coming up with different materials to make his cylinders. After foil, he went to wax, but that wasn't the final stage of evolution. This was. This is an Edison blue amberol cylinder. Blue amberol was a type of, it's almost a shellac. It could hold nearly four minutes of music and was capable of many, many, many playbacks without a noticeable loss in quality. This was where the Edison phonograph technology stopped evolving. So let's just look at a phonograph here. This is a really simple model. Edison quickly came to the conclusion that he was going to need to regulate the speed of spin, the speed of playback and record. Otherwise, if you were turning his hand crank slower while recording and faster while playing back, the pitch of your voice would go up and you'd get this sort of chipmunk effect, right? This is a spring-regulated mechanism. So the cylinder is going to spin at a consistent rate every time. 
later versions of the phonograph actually had two separate speeds. One for music that had greater fidelity but shorter playback time, and one for speech that wasn't quite as clear but had longer playback times. On this end of the phonograph, you have the diaphragm. Now, the diaphragms were removable, and usually there were two, one for recording and one for playing back. The great part about that is when you bought an Edison phonograph, you were buying both a recorder and a music playback device. Now, Edison didn't really envision this being used for music when he first created it. He saw this as an office tool. That was his idea, is that a boss could dictate into the, into the machine while the cylinder spun, and later the secretary could sit down and, and write up the letter listening to the recording. She could go back and listen any number of times. That was Edison's idea. But it didn't take long before some other industrious companies began to record music on these devices. Some of those companies actually lasted through the century, like, like Columbia House, who were one of the first to mass produce and market music. They were selling Edison cylinders through the mail and were still around when I was in high school. In fact, I got in all kinds of trouble because they sent a mailer saying they would send me 15 CDs for a penny each. So I opened like 15 accounts. I didn't realize that after that first 15 batch, they'd just keep sending you CDs along with a bill and they weren't a penny each anymore. And thus began my financial ruin. All right, this has been our lesson on the phonograph. Stick around. Next time, we're going to talk about Alexander Graham Bell and Emil Berliner and their respective devices. Till then, this is Scott Velasco, fading out. It was a Tuesday afternoon. He put his head